Okay, my name is Leanne Kutsia. I've been working for the City Council for about 11 years, straight out of varsity. And um, I did my uh, master's there in microbiology. And now I've been working here as the drinking water scientist, checking drinking water quality. I'm Carl Talliard, um, agricultural engineer. Uh, worked in the water sector for most of my life, past 20 years for City of Twani, uh, last 10 years uh, managing the plant. Uh, Rithlay was built in 1932, the plant was built in 1934, uh, as a, the dam is part of City of Twani. Um, specifically built for water purification to the city and um, during the years it was upgraded a couple of times. Last time it was upgraded in uh, 1999 uh, when we add the granular activated carbon and currently there's some construction going on for the uh, construction of ozone to the plant. The Rifflay Dam uh, has a capacity of 12 million cubic meters. Um, we purify 40 milliliters per day on a continuous basis. Um, production of the plant is in the region of 37 to 38 megaliters per day. Uh, water quality is exceptionally good. The, the catchment area is about 400 square kilometers. Um, Mostly, most of the water is coming from the uh, Kempton Park area. Um, the Artwees Fontaine Sewage Works is contributing to, to the dam uh, with their effluent water. Um, the dam is uh, classed as a Category 3 dam. Um, and it's got a high risk potential because of the, where it's situated and um, that there's some highways and um, uh, people living downstream of the dam. If the quality of the effluent is fairly good, then the risks are fairly low. Obviously, it's, it's a question of how much you monitor as well. But because we've got a dam that's highly eutrophic, that means that there's got, uh, it's got a lot of nutrients in it. Um, we have quite a lot of problems with um, algal growth, specifically blue-green algae. And that causes a lot of issues when we come to um, tastes and odours and these blue-green algae even produce toxins. So that is also a health risk and a health concern for the tap water. Our first priority is a, a long-term thing, it's called catchment management, and I'm sure most people know about that. But it's um, not the easiest thing to implement and it is a long-term project. So we talk regularly to, uh, regularly to the hard to be a uh, Fontaine sewage treatment plant, and um, they actually warn us if there's problems there. Then we also have sample points upstream of the dam and we have sample points in the dam and then we start monitoring as we go through the process after every critical control point. Our biggest problems are probably the algae. Um, when we're talking about blue-green algae, they can regulate their buoyancy. So at a certain stage of the day, they, they move past the draw-off point. And when they do that, we have trouble. And then the turbidity uh, jumps from like one point something to 20 or 30 uh, turbidity units, which causes havoc with the treatment process. Another problem that we've experienced once or twice is when we have a severe flood, then we get high turbidity water and the plant is not normally geared to high turbidity water with particulate matter. So then it's a, it's a bit of a shock for the system. The 
Solar bees are high powered reservoir circulators. They basically um, work on a very simple principle of just lifting the water a, a small amount, uh, a small height, just a little bit, and pushing the water out. So it sucks it up from a certain depth wherever you set the, the solar bee hose. And it sucks it up the hose and it lets it flow out on the top, causing it like a, almost like a laminar flow. And due to this, it causes the water to so start circulating. And by doing that, we are disturbing the habitat of the blue-green algae. This is a, a, a first for South Africa. Um, it, is one of the, it has been used with lots of success in America and Australia and several other places. But this is the first time it's been done in Africa. This Veritfle Dam is a COT, a City of Chwani owned dam. And um, it's a small dam. It's fairly well controlled, so we can put these things in and make sure that they tend to stay there. And um, we have a lot of data on this dam. We've got data going back for 20 or 30 years. So because of that fact, it makes it easier to compare before and after. The <coughs> uh, dam's got a dwarf tower. Uh, we're lucky enough that we've got three, uh, three different dwarf points. Um, we can change the dwarf point to um, see where's the best quality of water. From the dwarf point, it's coming into the plant. Uh, first, um, we uh, add lime for pH correction purposes. Thereafter, we add a coagulant, which can vary depending on the water quality through the year and what is um, the best at that stage. From the dosing point, it's going through the flock channels, giving us a 10 minutes contact uh, time uh, through the flock channels for the flock to grow. Um, once it's through the flock channels, it's into the DAF filters. We've got dissolved air flotation and filtration filters, uh, meaning that we've got two processes combined in one filter box. The <coughs> water is entering the filter behind the weir. Um, as it enters, we also add saturated air water mix to the water. The air bubbles um, is actually lifting all the impurities that wants to float. The heavier uh, impurities in the water, the heavier flocks, will settle down at the filters and from there it's a normal sand filter. The sand filters is made up of uh, various grades of uh, gravel and sand uh, as well as some um, anthracite to give us a bigger surface area to catch the um, impurities that's still in the water. From the DEF uh, outlet box, it's going through a screw pump, uh, a comedian screw pump. Uh, it's lifted to the GAC filters. Uh, the reason for the pump is just to, to gain enough height to get it through the uh, GAC filters. The GAC filters is granular activated carbon. Um, the main aim of the filters is to remove taste and odours, which is associated with the blue-green algae. Um, from the granular activated carbon filters, it is going into the reservoir. Just before entering the reservoir, we're doing the disinfection. At this stage, it's done with uh, chlorine gas. Um, from there, it's pumped to two uh, reception reservoirs where it's blended with rainwater water at this stage. We have catchment management um, samples, so we do samples of the raw water in the dam. We also do samples right through the process. Um, after we get the raw water in, after it goes through the DAF process, after it goes through the GAC, and then once it's chlorinated, we also take a sample. These we monitor for um, the constituents as mentioned in the uh, SANS 241, the South African National Drinking Water Standard. Um, we also then 
monitor the water from the, the final water all the way through after the reservoirs we monitor. We have uh, network points and point of use, actual consumers who uh, give us samples from their house. So we get a complete picture from catchment to consumer, which is what the World Health Organization and everybody who knows anything about water and wants us to do is from catchment to consumer. Um, the purpose of the online meters is to give us a, a better feel of what's happening on a continuous basis. The pH meter on the uh, raw water, we have a turbidity meter on the raw water that's also to monitor if we have a sudden increase in algal mass that we'll be able to pick it up early before it hits the, the filters. Each filter also has an a online turbidity meter and that's basically to monitor the filter performance and also to check that our dosage is correct. So in other words, when we start seeing that there's an increase in the turbidity of the, of the filter effluent, we know that we need to uh, have a We've actually got a standard operating procedure in place there, so the operator will know that they need to take steps when they see that the, f the filter effluent is rising. And then um, we've also got a chlorine meter on the final. We monitor that chlorine on a continuous basis. Obviously, that's one of the most serious places that we need to monitor to check that the chlorine is sufficient. It can differ. Um, at Ritfly we don't have settling tanks, for instance, which is more common on traditional uh, purification plants. Um, because of the fact that we've got a lot of algae and uh, they're fairly light and they want to float, uh, we, well, many years ago they opted for the option to use the flotation process. Um, the Granular activated carbon is also it was the first uh, plant in South Africa that introduces that. It is um, a very good practice at this stage. It proved to be uh, very successful. Um, <coughs> and um, we have, uh, it is still a, a very good practice, although it was not initially intended for that to help us with the endocrine disrupting chemicals. That is also a problem um, for most of the dams in South Africa, but also for red flag. Um, for the other procedures, most of it is standard, stand, sand filters. Um, the type of chemicals used can vary quite a lot. Uh, the process of uh, coagulating the water uh, getting uh, flocks in the water can vary uh, from place to place and from types of waters that uh, have to be treated. Uh, disinfection can vary, um, but most common is chlorine uh, dosing to disinfect water. Red Flow is fortunate in the sense that it's close to the big cities. Uh, it's a fairly small plant, fairly compacted. Um, so there's a lot of universities in the surrounding areas in Joburg and Pretoria. So there's a lot of the academics that would like to be involved with Red Flow. And I think they help a lot in selecting processes. Um, Professor Johannes Harov from the uh, University of Joburg at this stage uh, played a major role in processes that was introduced to the plant and then I think I must just mention that our previous boss, Piet Cronier, was uh, also open-minded to accept these new approaches. Um, I can just mention that the DEF Filtration process was also first in South Africa as well as a granular activated carbon process. Uh, this time around we are not the first with ozone in South Africa. Um, ozone has been used a lot 
overseas especially and um, in this particular instance we're going to be using it for breaking down the organic compounds, the very complex organic uh, molecules that we find between the, the DEF process and the GAC process. So basically it's going to be able to help us break down those organic molecules so that the GAC beds um, will work more effectively than before and also to improve the biological activity on the GAC beds. Basically those compounds are complex organic molecules, they're actually too complex to for our limited lab anyway to be able to um, determine exactly what they are. But there's just, the, the total organic carbon is easily removed in the DAF process, the, the easily removed to, uh, TOC is removed in the DAF process, but the more complex, harder to degrade compounds have to go through the GAC. So we feel that by breaking them up into smaller bits, we'll be able to um, get rid of them much easier. I think every water purification plant should have a lab. It's a question of how big the lab should be. Um, we are lucky, uh, I guess, because We've got a fairly well-equipped lab. We've been very lucky. We've been able to get um, very good equipment and we're basically fully kitted out for, or mostly, I'd say about 90% kitted out for the SANS 2 for one drinking water uh, specifications, all the analyses that we need to do for that. Um, most water treatment plants have basic things that they do on the works themselves and the operators are generally responsible for that. That's like pH and turbidity and chlorine residuals and colour. Um, but what the uh, big advantage is for reach flay is that if there's a problem, it's attended to the same day. It's not a question of take the sample and wait another two weeks. Um, that's the nice thing about reach flay. Reach flay situated, uh, the reach flay lab is situated here. We do a lot of work on the reach flay lab, but we also do a lot of work on the uh, drinking water in Chwani. So we only, not only look at the, at the process here, but we also look at the, the final quality to the consumer and also the, the other treatment works that, that impact on City of Chwani's drinking water. The Reedflay water treatment plant produces about 6% of the city of Chuani's drinking water requirements. The remainder of the water is, the, the bulk of it is about rand water, it's about 70%. And then there, there's about 100 megalitres of water a day that's from our own water sources, that's Reedflay included. And then we have um, two other water treatment plants that produce water for us but are managed by Mahali's water. Uh, process controllers is five at this stage, uh, plus a senior process controller and then um, with the process controllers there's two shift workers or eight shift workers actually because one of the process controllers is uh, doing the outstations. The, uh, so there's eight pro uh, shift workers with the process controller. So per shift three people on the plant, one uh, process controller to uh, general workers with the senior process controller. Plant is run 24 hours per day, seven days a week, throughout the year. Um, our requirements is that they must have a tertiary qualification in water and wastewater uh, purification. Um, we uh, employ people with a uh, class three uh, Water Affairs Certificate, or we, we aim for that, uh, Class 3 or higher. Um, once a year, they, we would like to add training to it. Uh, at this stage, the, the training that's compulsory for them is uh, safe handling of chlorine, which is a very uh, important part of the plant and a very um, dangerous type of operation, so it's very important that we do that. I think we were fairly lucky. Um, at Reedflay up to now that we've got uh, good uh, process operators. Um, it is very important that a process controller must be aware of what's happening around him, um, wake up that he wants to um, 
check the processes, see that dosing is done correctly, uh, see that the water, uh, final water quality is good, um, talk to other people and make sure that in general the water is, is, is of a good quality because it's impacting on uh, the public's health directly. So it's, it's a very important process. Yes. Um, a new designs on the plant, major designs, is conducted by consultants. Um, uh, the construction, obviously, also bigger uh, contractors that, that's appointed to do that. Small designs like a small little pump or a pipe or so on, we can do in-house, but uh, all the major uh, improvements is done by consultants. Occupational health and safety is quite a, a huge um, part of running a plant like this, uh, very important. Um, to me, one of the most important parts of the plant um, the, the safety towards the water that we purify, but the people working on the plant, that occupational health and safety is a first priority, in my opinion. Um, we've got regular meetings with um, health and safety officials with working within Tuani. Um, there is also uh, accreditation done by the Department of Labour at this stage. They've been here and we were lucky that um, we came off fairly well after their visit. Um, there's, uh, Safety reps appointed at various points, um, regular training for uh, body aid training and first aid. Um, we do outsource some of our tests. Um, some of them are just not feasible to do in a lab like this. Um, that's like viruses. There's only one lab who can actually do it. So we send our viruses there. And um, the Cryptosporidium and Giardia is protozoan parasites. We send those to an accredited facility. Um, it's actually Randwater does it for us because they're uh, internationally accredited for that method. Um, once um, a year I will take a couple of samples and send it to a, an external lab an accredited external lab for um, verification purposes. We also do proficiency testing. So um, we, every month we get samples from uh, independent that um, we analyze and we send it back and then we compare our results to those of other labs. And that's both for the chemistry and the microbiology. When we started looking at something to help us with the raw water quality, we had a look at a lot of different alternatives. There's a lot of things on the market that claim to be good, whether they're good or not is, is another point. But um, we decided to try this because um, it has been done in several other lakes that have been used in drink for drinking water quality. So those people have got quite a lot of knowledge as a solar bee in um, America. And they actually helped us a lot with the sites, um, how to space the solar bees, how far apart we need to put them. They're about 450 meters apart. And um, they had a look at the bathymetric maps of the dam to enable us to make sure that they, they spaced um, in the correct way. Um, and then the first six were put in in the area where the algae grows the most. And then later on when we got the other 10, we placed them in the rest of the dam. So this is the largest dam with full-scale treatment in the world. The solo bee is a patented um, piece of equipment that comes solely from America. So there's no South African involvement apart from the fact that we're the first guinea pigs as such. It's, it's a long-term process and um, we've had it in for two years now and I think that now we can start seeing a difference. 
uh, there's a lot of factors involved because we've had a lot of rainfall this last year. So it could be the rainfall, it could be the solar bees. However, um, comparing it to other dams in the area, the other dams are not doing as well as, as Red Flay. Um, we're doing a lot of uh, tests, I go out on the dam at least once a month, and then some I go out twice a month to draw samples at different depths, and I do temperature profiles and shaky disc and all kinds of interesting, weird and wonderful stuff to, to monitor the algae and to monitor the condition of the dam. So hopefully by using the before and after we'll be able to see if it's really working or not. The <coughs> award was um, awarded to the most presentable medium-sized plant in the country, meaning that it's well-maintained, neat, clean uh, and efficient. Uh, the people that did the uh, um, adjudication for that was um, guys from the UK, two separate people, so we won it um, twice and so we hope that we can carry on with it um, just doing our work as we're supposed to do and we, we're very thankful for the recognition of uh, achieving that. Blue Drop was uh, a program that was initiated by the Department of Water Affairs. I think they started working on it in about 2008 um, because they realized that they weren't getting information on, blue, uh, on drinking water. Blue Drop is for drinking water regulation. And they weren't getting enough information on the quality of drinking water coming out of the tap. So they started this, this initiative and it grew and grew to become Blue Drop, which is basically a list of, of regulations that they, or not regulations, but a list of uh, things that they come to audit you on. So it, it's everything from drinking water quality to um, asset management to process controllers to uh, publication of drinking water quality performance. It's all these things and more. It's about managing your drinking water with excellence. Uh, to win Blue Drop status is, is quite um, an achievement by any standards because um, you only get a blue drop if you're above 95%. So there's a whole lot of municipalities that are being audited by internal and external um, people from, South from the Department of Water Affairs, from the United Kingdom. There's, a, uh, there's an agreement between the United Kingdom and the Department of Water Affairs uh, to run this system. And they come out and they do all the, uh, check all your aspects of drinking water quality management. So by doing that, the consumer knows that that municipality or that system that has been awarded Blue Drop means that they are doing it right and that even if something goes wrong, that we know how to react. So it's, it's just to give the consumer drink, uh, public confidence in drinking water. There were over 700 systems that were assessed in this last 2010 year and of them 13% got above 90% and you only get Blue Drop when you get above 95%. So I think there were 26 blue drops this last year. Then we can attribute the blue drop status to maintenance issues. We, we have a lot of a good routine maintenance. We have uh, routine maintenance and non-routine maintenance. And we also have a lot of procedures in place already. The big challenge with blue drop is to get all the knowledge that's in your head onto the paper and to get all the team players involved because not all, the not all the members of the team are sitting at Red Flay Water Treatment Plant. Coral and I are lucky because we sit very close together. And a lot of what we do is all about Blue Drop. But there's a lot of other things where when it comes to asset management and financial management, we need to include those people from, from other areas. And to get the right team in place, to get them committed, and to get them writing down what they know is, is really important. Um, <clears throat> the blue drop assessment um, is gradually increasing in the intensity and difficulty. Um, the first round we were lucky enough that a lot of that stuff was in place and 
not in the format that they would like it to be, but that the basic data was available. Um, the past year we had to put that together in a different format and get it going and um, that helped a little bit that we had to do that. Um, we also had to include other role players um, that's not on the plant and in the lab uh, because it's actually increasing what, what, what the requirements is. Um, so yes, there was a couple of meetings. It is uh, a process of getting everybody on board to, to do that and to get their knowledge on paper, as Leanne said. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if your attitude is that you can gain something from it, it is working. And um, although in the beginning we were all skeptical, especially myself, um, I can see that, that it is gaining momentum and that it probably will help uh, the country now. I think there's obviously scope because there's so many facets of treatment of water in all its forms that I think we shouldn't be blinded by what we already know, but obviously look at new things and try them out. Um, so I do think there's scope for doing things a little bit more naturally and organically and ecologically sound. The uh, red the uh, nature conservation part that's part of uh, the, the, the farm on which the, the plant is built um, is actually well maintained, well managed, uh, the dam is well managed, there's no um, motor boating allowed on the dam, so I think we are very fortunate in that sense that the water quality is um, not, uh, that there's not a lot of pollution impacting on the uh, plant from external sources apart from uh, what is running downstream. That there they, they is a bit of a couple of challenges um, from farming and uh, fertilizing the, the soil and so on. But uh, at the dam itself, we're very fortunate that it's, it's, it's well maintained. Yes, there, there is possibilities of increasing the capacity if we get more water uh, from sources outside of this catchment area. Um, for the, the catchment as it is now, I think we sort of limited to our maximum capacity and we're fairly fortunate that we can run on basically maximum capacity at all times. we probably do have a water crisis. Um, the reason why we got there, that's a very long complicated question, but it's probably due to mismanagement, um, to people who aren't properly trained or don't really know the impact. It's probably due to poor catchment management, it's probably due to uh, irresponsible manufacturers that pollute water sources. Um, or mines that aren't properly regulated and controlled. Um, how do we get out of it? It's going to be a long journey to get out of that one. I, I think we're probably heading in the right direction now. I know that there's a, the Green Drop Initiative by the Department of Water Affairs will help a lot, um, but it will be a long and hard road to climb out of the mess that we find ourselves in. I think the, the one thing that we really need in this country as a whole and I, I, from what I see in the water sector is that um, the political boundaries, the boundaries of the towns and, and the cities are not always the water boundaries and the communication is lacking between the authorities running the city or the towns and the actual water moving through them. 
if the authorities could speak to each other more and talk to each other more about the water going through them, then I think we'd be a lot better off. With regards to water, I think South Africa is fortunate that um, the quality of educated people is fairly high. Still, there's still um, some expertise available, although it seems as though that is becoming less as we carry on and there, there, there's some big concerns about uh, people leaving the country with uh, necessary knowledge. Um, I think, as if I can speak from Ritzley point of view, um, we need attitude. I think attitude is extremely important on all plants. Um, and we must educate people about the importance of good quality drinking water and what the impact is if your water is contaminated and what uh, the health impact will be. From time to time we get visitors from other African countries. Um, I think they learn a lot f from us. They, they're very eager to learn. Um, I think if the politics in those countries are run uh, as they're supposed to be and people start noticing what uh, the importance of good quality drinking water is, it, it can be done. Um, the attitude is very important that they uh, must be willing to do that but I'm pretty sure it can be done. I suppose South Africa and experts in South Africa can still contribute quite a lot to those countries by um, advice, um, work that can be done there. Um, I think there's, there's still a lot of knowledgeable people in the country that can also help some of the uh, municipalities that are struggling at this stage. Um, to achieve blue drop status, to better their water quality, uh, if they are allowed to do that. Um, I kind of hope that Ritfle will carry on winning um, the awards that we've won. Um, for the city of Chwani with regards to blue drop status, we want to get better and better. Um, I'm pretty sure that we'll, that we'll probably get an increase in our score. Um, that's what we're aiming for every year. Um, with regards to the green drop, I know that we are busy on, on the green drop issues and that management is aware of it and keen to fix things that are lacking. Um, with regards to water in general, it really depends on who's running it. I think South Africa as a whole can look at various options of using water and I think the public must be made aware of how you can use water. Um, grey water can be used for flushing toilets and those things. Um, if computers could have developed to where it is today, the water sector can develop with that as well and water can be used twice perhaps um, or even more and in that sense we can get away probably with less water if people just managing it better. In Australia they've got um, a rebate system for rainwater harvesting and uh, the reuse of grey water and I think that's something that we should seriously look at because we're also a water scarce country so it makes sense to do that kind of thing. I'd like to think that the water community in general is um, quite closely connected and very open to discussion. I've had lots of, uh, I've learnt a lot through picking up the telephone and phoning somebody and saying, listen, I need some help here. So I've got quite a, a, a lot of people that I know that are experts in their field that I can contact when I need help. And that makes a big difference. I think no matter where you are, um, and what you're doing and whatever level of training you have, it's always nice to have somebody to confirm your suspicions. I know that the engineers are 
uh, few and far between, and the scientists probably even fewer. Um, it's not a field that somehow gets a lot of graduates. I know that there have been programs in place. I know Emisa has done a whole lot of work on trying to encourage people to walk into the water field and to the, into the engineering sector as well. But um, there's not a lot of new kids on the block at the moment. I think if we want to increase the quality of drinking water and the uh, treatment of wastewater in general, um, politicians must play a big role in it to allow people to do the work without um, putting in constraints to, to get those people out of the business. You want everybody that knows the work to be in that field and to contribute as much as possible back into that field. And um, I think it's very important that politics must stay out of it. There is a lot of infrastructure in the country that can be better maintained. And I think it's very important to put in processes and practices to do preventative maintenance, to maintain things. Um, you can't run a car with flat tires. And I think that in many cases uh, the infrastructure was there. Um, it must be run properly. It must be maintained. And I think a, a huge problem in the country is that the maintenance part is lacking. Um, and we must be careful not to redesign and um, change the plant, but rather keep that what's there in place until there's enough money or resources available to upgrade it. But, uh, Probably most, a lot of plants can, by good maintenance, uh, speed up their the, uh, production and um, quality. First you're going to have to prove that it was the tap water, and that is hard enough. So it's easy if it's, if it's something like a protozoan parasite. that they can isolate from your body and prove that it's a parasite that can come from drinking water. But you have to, there's so many, you know, water is normally not the only thing that carries those particular things. So you're going to have to isolate everything else. It's very difficult to actually trace it back. Unless you can prove there was a failure in the plant and then you look at maintenance records and you look at operational records. And if that's missing, how do you know? You won't know. It doesn't help you take a final water sample the day after you put your chlorine cylinder in, you let it run empty, and then two months later you buy another chlorine cylinder and take another sample. Then the water's going to look good, but it's not. You see, normally the, the Department of Water Affairs will issue a directive to say, clean up your act. But a directive, I see now one particular municipality's had a directive for like 18 months, and they've done nothing in the meantime. So it actually means that politician should land in jail. The mayor, or the SED, or whatever, should land in jail for that. That it becomes a real big hard stick, because otherwise you're not going to get it right. It's just not going to work. Home treatment devices are not necessary if you live in the city of Chwani. It's not necessary if you're living in any kind of metro that's got a blue drop status. Um, I would not buy it. I think it's a waste of money. Um, with regards to how, what they do, yes, they do purify the water to a certain extent. The question is, why do you want to purify it to that level? It doesn't help you purify it to battery water level and then you're taking a multivitamin. Um, it's a bit silly to me. With regards to um, bottled water, I would suggest bottled water is mainly for convenience. It's got a very high carbon footprint and if you're not buying from a reputable supplier then the quality can be questionable sometimes, especially if it's been on the shelf for a long time. So if you're going to have to buy bottled water then I'd say buy a bottled water that comes from a bottler who's registered with the South African National Bottled Water Association. But in Chwani, fill your bottle at the tap. <laughs>